Okay, this is a lecture for my fifth hour class on the 3rd of April. Okay, uh, pass those back. I'll return them to you permanently. Um, but when we left off the other day, we were finishing up Teddy Roosevelt's administration. Yeah, just pass those over. By the way, tomorrow you will have a quiz over what we talk about uh, today. So, so uh, I want to get on. Um, well, Roosevelt read Upton Sinclair's Upton Sinclair, this famous muckraker. Roosevelt read Sinclair's book, uh, and he, you know, exposed how filthy the practices were in the food preparation, especially slaughterhouse, the food preparation uh, industry in this country. And he sent a bill called the Pure Food and Drug Act to the Congress, and they passed it. And of course, uh, our food supply today is safe. Again, you know, odds on, you may uh, get some tainted food and may get ill. Once in a while, there's uh, something that's there's some sort of breakout, and we're warned about it. But by and large, our food supply is safe due to two people, I think, uh, Upton Sinclair pointing out the problem, and Teddy Roosevelt, the president of the United States, doing something about it. And then get this down, he's our first, Teddy Roosevelt is our first environmental president, okay? Let me see which way I want to go here. He's our first environmental president. Um, there he is. Uh, he's going to... Today, you know, today the environment is a big issue, global warming. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, look, um, beginning in 1492, Europeans started coming here and they established colonies and they would, uh, they would uh, you know, farm the land, come out of the forest, dab up the rivers. For example, in Virginia, they raised tobacco beginning in 1619, 300 years before Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and tobacco is one of the worst things that you can plant. It destroys the soil. They weren't worried about it. When the soil in Virginia was destroyed, they just moved, or in one spot was destroyed, they just moved 10 miles west, and 10 miles west, and 10 miles west. People had this attitude that the natural resources of this uh, country would never end. There would always be clean water. There would always be farmland. There would always be forests to cut down. Uh, but by the time Teddy Roosevelt became president, he's the first president of the 20th century, uh, it was becoming apparent, get this down, that if we didn't conserve, that's the word, if we didn't conserve our natural resources, uh, they would, would run out eventually. And so Roosevelt wants to preserve the uh, nature. And to that end, he created a spot in the cabinet. You know what the president's cabinet is. It's a group of the people that advise the president, the secretary of state and foreign affairs, the secretary of Tre the treasury and the economy, the secretary of war and military affairs. And Roosevelt uh, put, uh, he created the chief forester. Write that down. He put a man in the cabinet, chief forester. His name was Gifford Pinchot great friend of Roosevelt's, write this man down right here too, uh, uh, John Muir, he wasn't uh, in the cabinet, but he was an environmentalist, okay? There's that word, environmentalist, <clears throat> okay? And he started, and uh, it still exists to this day, if you're concerned about the environment, one great organization you can join that tries to ensure that future generations have clean air and clean water, and the future generations can go out and see the great virgin forests that have stood here since time immemorial, uh, the Sierra Club. Uh, John Muir was the uh, founder of one, in 1902 of the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club fights to uh, preserve the environment, okay? Uh, Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt, uh, also was concerned about animals. Get this down. He's a great hunter. He shot enough of them. He should have been concerned. But uh, today you can go and see 500,000 live buffalo, bison, that still exist. By the time Teddy Roosevelt became president, they were down to 200. It's just a miracle that you can go see a live, a live uh, buffalo. Uh, but Roosevelt is partially responsible for that. 
uh, it finally dawned on the country. Uh, and by the way, and, and get this down, who did he say should enforce these environmental rules? Who, who could do that? Who? What? The people. Not the people. No, the people. No. No. Huh? That's, that's, that's like saying, who should enforce the rules of this class? Oh, the students. No. No. no that's not. What? The government. the government. Write that down. Roosevelt's progressive. Progressives believe in government. I know we believe the government's the enemy today. But I assure you, we can't pass enough chicken buckets at the football game to make sure the Arkansas River is pure. You understand that by the late 1960s, lightning struck rivers in America and the rivers caught on fire. They were so polluted. You understand that in America, there were rivers you could catch fish out of. In my lifetime, you could catch fish out of, but you couldn't eat them because they'd kill you. You understand that in China today, the most populous nation on earth, there's not enough water because they polluted it. You understand that in China today, they can catch fish out of their rivers, but they can't eat it. They try it, and it gives them cancer. It's killing them like the plague, okay? That's what uh, ignoring the environment does, this idea that, you know, everything. By the way, what do lumber companies, they regulated lumber companies. What do lumber companies do, have to do today when they cut out a forest as they're cutting it down? Yeah, they got to plant for every tree they cut down, they got to plant a new one. You know what that's called? That's called conservation. And because of Teddy Roosevelt, you can go out to California to the Yosemite. Now, have any of you been out to Yosemite National Park? And you can see those gigantic redwood trees. Take half this class to reach around one. You know how tall those trees were when Jesus was on the earth 2,000 years ago? They were about that tall. You know what the lumber companies wanted to do when Teddy Roosevelt was president? They wanted to cut those magnificent things down. Those are more than trees. They're a national treasure. And Roosevelt saved them, okay? through uh, conservation. Look at this. Look at that. That's a waste. That's the national Christmas tree. Every year we go out and we find this beautiful tree growing on the slope of some mountain, some tree that it took nature 200 years to uh, create. And we cut it down, uh, put it in a truck, bring it to Washington, D.C. They load it in a wagon full by six horses and they take it into the front of the White House. They take it in front of the White House and there's a choir there. They stand it up, they decorate it, uh, and then this choir sings, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And there's a little glassed-in booth here. That's not the First Lady, that's a guest of the First Lady, and she's in a little glassed-in booth and she flips the switch and the light on the National Christmas tree comes on and we all ooh and ah. And that Christmas tree stands up for about 30 days. Took nature 200 years to create it. It stands up for about 30 days, and then what do we do with it after that? Okay. We burn it. Exactly right. Here's what I think. Uh, by the way, Teddy Roosevelt, I'll get this down. He banned the National Christmas tree for seven days. We didn't have one. He said, We're not going to do that. What a waste. <clears throat> Here's what I think we ought to do. You see that? I think we ought to go to the Dollar General store and buy one of those. <laughs> for that. We could use it year after year to save the taxpayers some money. That could be our national Christmas tree. Just stick it out there. 30 days later, pull it back. Okay. Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt said no national Christmas tree. Look at that. What's that? Grand Canyon. That's a good How many of you been out there? The Grand Canyon. Oh, great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Here's another beautiful picture. You know what they wanted to do? You know what some people wanted to do to make a buck? You know, money, make a buck. No, they didn't want to blow up the canyon. I don't know how much they would make money doing that. They wanted to, well, I guess they wanted to blow up a little part of it. They wanted to level off the sides of it so they could put hotels there, okay? Put hotels on the side of the Grand Canyon so when people came out to see the Grand Canyon, they would have a place to stay. Did you ever hear anything more ignorant, stupid, all you... It took nature millions of years to create that, and some idiots wanted to put a hotel there. And Roosevelt was beside himself. He asked his cabinet, what can we do about that? They said, Mr. President, you can declare, you can make, you can make the Grand Canyon a national monument, and nobody can touch it. And that's what Roosevelt did. And that's why you and your grandkids and your great, 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 great grandkids will be able to go out and see the Grand Canyon, okay, the Grand Canyon. And also write this down, write this down. He also set aside the Alaskan wilderness, the Alaskan wilderness. There was coal up there, there still is. We're not a coal burning nation anymore, but we were then. What is there up there now that people want? Huh? Coal. No, no, people, there's coal there coal. now. People, we don't want coal. We don't burn coal. What? Oil. Yes, oil. You know. And by the way, if we go, 
And by the way, what if the big oil company, you know, big coal companies in Roosevelt say, said, you know, we can go up there and we can see the mine shaft, right? You understand that this is pretty. You understand what I'm talking about? The north slope of Alaska is pristine. It looks like it did on creation morning. The human race hasn't spoiled it like it has almost everything else on this planet. And they said, we can dig mine shafts down there to get that coal. But don't worry, we'll put it right back just like it was. You think that's possible? The answer to that's no. And Roosevelt stopped it. One of the big oil companies, when I worked on an oil rig a couple of times when I was paying my way through college, horrible experience, but I was making more money than I'd ever made in my life. I was making five bucks an hour. I mean, I always had money. But the filthiest, one of the filthiest, nast nastiest things on the face of the earth is an oil rig. That's why they hire goobers like me to take a bucket of diesel in the brush and when we're not, you know, tripping, changing out pipe, you know, we're standing on the side of that thing, scrubbing off the, the muck from the side of it. Horrible. You know what the big oil companies now say? They said, just let's go up there. My party, the Republican Party, they, they chant, drill, baby, drill. They want to go up there and drill uh, to get oil so they can make gas and gasoline will be cheaper here. I swear to God, there are people that would stand naked on the top of the fall post office and set their hair on fire if you would promise them that the gasoline would drop by 10 cents a gallon. I swear. I swear. And so far, they've kept them from doing that, but that they're pushing and you know what the oil company say? We won't turn drill that oil up. And when we're done, we'll put it just back just like it was. And you won't even be able to tell we were there. Who believes that? Who believes that? Nobody with a brain. In my opinion, I may be, for all you people out there, I may be absolutely wrong. Maybe drilling in the Alaskan wilderness will make it better. Anyway, Roosevelt stopped that. Get that down. Well, get this down. He was reelected by a landslide in 1904. You remember he became president when McKinley was killed in 1901? He was reelected by a landslide in 1904. And he was young as president. Good Lord, especially today. How old is President Biden? He's, He's a day older than God. How old is Trump? <laughs> How old is Trump? 70. Huh? He's a day older than 70. 70s. He's got 70. teeth older than 70. Anyway, yeah, Trump, you know, he's 80. I mean, we like these old grandpas. When are you people going to rise up and take over this country and elect someone that is young? The future is in youth. You understand, Miss Burns, when more people in this great and free republic look like me than you, we got real problems in this great and free republic. Okay? You ought to put all of us out on an ice floe and scoot us off and say, you've lived your days, get out of here. We're going to run this country. Well, Roosevelt was only 46. That means if he ran for a second term in 1904, he would be 50. And as presidents go, 50 is still pretty young. But, uh, and by the way, in those days, there were no term limits. Teddy Roosevelt could have been elected forever if he wanted to run. And he could have, you know, in 1904, he wins this huge landslide. He could have easily been reelected in 1908, but get this down, on election night 1904, get this down, on election night 1904, <laughs> he made the biggest mistake he ever made in his political career. Was Teddy Roosevelt someone who was uh, prone to, uh, in the excitement of the moment, sort of fly off the handle a little bit? Uh, absolutely he was. And here he was, his supporters were cheering. He had just won this great landslide. He didn't beat William Jennings Bryan. That's not until 1908. Uh, but uh, he had beaten a guy named Alton V. Parker, or Alton Parker. Nobody remembers that guy. But anyway, his, his, his supporters were cheering and shouting, and Roosevelt was just caught up in it. And he said this, and I've never read a historian who understands why he said this. You ever say something and before the words were completely out of your mouth, you were thinking, eh, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Well, Roosevelt says, get this down. Why? I said, why did he say I don't know. And I've studied history for 50 years. I don't know. I've never read an explanation for this. Roosevelt said, I will not be a candidate in 1908. <clears throat> I will not be a candidate in 1908. Oh, my God. I will not be a candidate for president in 1908. And he almost immediately regretted it. Well, by 1908, get this down, he was more popular than ever. The people wanted him to run. Listen, he wanted to run. He, in 1908, he wanted to be president so bad he could taste it. But true to his word, 
He did not run. And Stan, in his mind, get this down. He did the next best thing. He got the Republican nomination. Write that down. He got the Republican nomination for his best friend. Who was his best friend? And if Roosevelt's for you in 1908, you're going to be president. There, there he is with his best friend. Who's that? Will, excellent. Write that down. William Howard Taft. Write that down. Taft had been Roosevelt's in Roosevelt's cabinet. He had been the Secretary of War. William Howard Taft. Okay. He had been the Secretary of War. And Roosevelt said... And Roosevelt supported him, and he got the Republican nomination. And with Roosevelt's support, Taft was going to win going away. There was only one problem. Get this down. There's only one problem for Taft in this election. Write this down. There's only one problem. And that was his religion. Okay, that was his religion. I've heard people say, if we ever elect someone president, who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's the end of America. Well, you're a little too late because in 1908, that's exactly what this country did. They elected someone who said Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. It was William Howard Taft, right? This time. Now he said Jesus is a wise philosopher and a good teacher, but he wasn't God. The whole basis of the Christian religion is that Jesus is God. Isn't that right? Yes, yes, that's what it is. Yeah. Well, anyway, Taft was a Unitarian, okay? And in math, you see that word unit, what does that mean? Well, there's one. Unitarians believe, keep writing, Unitarians believe that there is one God. Well, of course, Christians say they believe that there is one God, but uh, what do they say about that one God? There is one God, but... He had a kid. Huh? He had a kid. Well, yes, he has a, he has a son. There's God, the Father... Son and Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That's called the Holy Christian religion. In case I haven't talked about that in church lately, it's called the Holy Trinity. I've often said if somebody could explain that to me, and, and you know, the Christian side it makes sense. There's three and there's one. There's one and there's three. Okay? Yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. It's either one or there's two or there's three. It can't be both. I've often said if somebody would explain that to me, don't do that. I've often said if somebody would explain that to me, I would convert. And I would. I got two minutes. You know, I would convert. How there can be one God, but he's three people. How Jesus can be on the cross talking to God up in heaven. And that's one. That's what the Unitarians say. I'm just telling you what the Unitarians say. The Unitarians say there's only one God. And if you believe in a Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, you believe in three gods. By the way, the Muslims say the same thing about the Christians. The Muslims believe that Jesus is a prophet. They don't believe he's the son of God. They say he can't be the son of God. If he was, there would be more than one God, and everybody knows there's just one God. And Christians say, well, yes, but we really believe there's just one God, but he appears in three forms. And Muslims and Unitarians and Jews, by the way, Jews, that's the religion that Christianity came from. They say Christians are polytheistic. They worship three gods instead of one. It's one of the big arguments in religion. Anyway, do you think somebody... Do you think somebody could be elected president of the United States? We're about to elect another one in 2024, and they got up and said that they did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's a wise man. He's a wise teacher. You should live by his precepts, but he's not the Son of God. Do you believe that could happen in this country today? Huh? No. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And that was the problem for that. Well, Roosevelt was, was a Christian, a practicing Christian. He believed in the Holy Trinity. He believed in one God, three forms, three, one. Roosevelt believed in that, and Roosevelt said, I'm going to go down to church on Sunday. By the way, there's a very fine-looking Unitarian church up at Jinx. I'm going to go Sunday. It looks like an English country church sitting out there. I'm going to go to church up there someday just to see the inside of it. But anyway, <clears throat> Roosevelt said, I'm going to church with my friend Tab. And all of Roosevelt's advisors said, don't go. Oh, my God. They said, you're the, you're the most heroic, you're one of the most heroic presidents. People love you. You go to that Unitarian church with Taft, and the people will turn on you like a rabid dog. And Roosevelt said, I'm going. And he went, and he sat down in the front row with Taft, and they sang hymns, and they prayed. And Taft, get this down, was elected by a landslide. He was elected by a landslide. 
huge majority for Tad. Okay, Roosevelt struck, stuck by his friend. That's his best friend. Just remember that. There's the presidential portrait of Taft. So now, I've got this. Oh, by the way, uh, Roosevelt stayed around. Look, Roosevelt stayed around long enough to see Taft sworn in. There they are on the inauguration day at the White House. Taft places his hand on the Bible. So she swears to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help him God. <coughs> and becomes president. And then Roosevelt, get this down, goes, he leaves the country for a year. He just takes off. Goes to Africa. Goes to Africa. Goes to Africa, okay? Lion hunting. You know, J.P. Morgan just hated Roosevelt. Remember J.P. Morgan, the big Wall Street banker? He just hated Roosevelt. And they asked Morgan. They said, you know, Morgan was getting out of his car, about to go to his bank on Wall Street in his bank, and a reporter said, Mr. Morgan, have you heard President Roosevelt's going lion hunting in Africa for a year? What do you think about that? And Morgan said, health to the lions. In other words, I hope the lions get him, okay? So Roosevelt takes off, and Taft moves into the White House. Write all these things out about Taft. Taft, put this down. Was our largest president. He's not our tallest. Lincoln's our tallest. The Taft was six foot two and he weighed 350 pounds. There he is playing golf. You know, there's the president, 350 pounds. There's a story, it's not true. <clears throat> Probably years ago I told it is true in a class before I read better. But that uh, Taft went up to get in the bathtub. 350 pounds and he got stuck and it had degrees of size. That would be one of the most embarrassing presidential moments. And that's not true, but he did go up and look at that bathtub and he said, I'll never fit in that. And so, uh, there he is. That's Taft's bathtub, okay? It weighs 2,400 pounds. It took four grown men, uh, took four grown men to uh, install it, uh, compare it to your bathtub at home, go home and get out your tape measure. This bathtub was eight foot long, and uh, it was 41 inches wide. How much did 41 it weigh? Inches wide. Huh? How much did it weigh? 2,400 pounds. It weighed over a ton. Okay. And they installed that in there. By the way, you know, Roosevelt hated automobiles. He built stables at the White House. Well, Taft couldn't, they couldn't find a horse to hold Taft up. There he is on the, there he was governor of the Philippines at one time. There he's on the, you can't see this poor animal's eyes, but it's going, God help me. Uh, they couldn't find a horse that could hold up Taft. And so he tore down Roosevelt's stables and he brought cars. He brought the devil, the devil wagons uh, in. Get this down about Taft. Now listen to me carefully. You're going to, uh, I don't want you to get confused here because you got to do this to understand what's going to happen in 1912. And that's where we're headed, 1912. Teddy Roosevelt hasn't given up on being president yet. Get this down. TR <clears throat> Look. When you talk about political philosophies, you have right wing, you have conservatives, you have moderates, you have liberals, and you have left wing. Okay? Left wing. Those are essentially the great, they'll do that. Those are essentially, we're going to take a break in just a minute, just kind of hold on. Uh, those are the one, two, three, four, five great political philosophies. And we're just going to use, to explain this to you, we're just going to use a, a really hotly contested issue in America today, gun control. Uh, liberals, a liberal would say, you know what? There, need to, there needs to be some restrictions on gun ownership. Maybe... No one should own a military assault weapon. Uh, maybe someone who has a criminal background 
uh, maybe they should not be allowed to own it. Just those restrictions. Uh, conservatives might say, you know, that's not really bad. Uh, we maybe agree with those things, although we demand the right to bear arms, a conservative would say. What would a left winger say? Huh? What? You can't own a pea shooter. And if we catch you, we're going to just put you in jail. We're going to put you out of the jail. <clears throat> what would a right winger say? What? Yeah, if I want a Sherman tank out there in my garage just for squirrel hunting, I just want to roll it out instead of having to stalk those little nippers, just roll it out, fire, hit the mountain, and kill them all, and then just go pick up their old. I ought to be able to do that. Second Amendment, I have the right to bear arms. I have the right to have 42 cases of dynamite in my basement, a flamethrower, uh, you know, and I'm working on a small bomb. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's, you understand that most of the time we consider these people and these people somewhat extreme. Okay? Extreme. <sighs> But there are people in the middle who are called moderates. And they take ideas from both. They say there are some things we believe or we agree with conservatives on. There are some things we agree with liberals on. We don't agree, we don't agree entirely with them, but we are moderate. You understand that? You understand what I'm talking about? Yes. What are most Americans, by the way? Most Americans are moderate. Okay. Now, these two make the most noise. They're, they scream, and people will think, oh my God, you know, the leftists are taking over the country, or these right wing cuckoos are taking over. No, they're not. They're just a small group. Everybody else is going about their business, going to work. But most Americans are somewhere in the middle. Okay, you understand that. Well, look, TR, get this down. TR was a liberal with moderate inclinations, write that down. He was liberal to moderate, okay? Taft, listen, who takes his place, you with me? Taft is conservative to moderate, okay? You understand that? Taft leans slightly conservative. They're both, listen, both TR and Taft are progressive liberals. The TR leans to the liberal side, and Taft leans more to the conservative side. You with me on that? Yes. Okay. So keep that keep that in your head. And by the way, I want you to write this down too about Taft. Uh, Taft was different from TR. He wasn't, get this down, he wasn't flashy. Write this down. He wasn't flashy. He wasn't loud. He wasn't a show off. Was TR all those things? Yes. Absolutely. Did, T did TR like a good fight? Yeah, he loved it. He loved it. He loved to bring those conservatives over to the White House and beat them up. He loved a good fight. He never passed up a political fight. Taft got this down. Wasn't that way. Taft said, can't we all just get along? Quote Rodney King. Can't we all just get along? You know, if we'll just sit down and talk about it, we can come to a there's no use for anybody to get mad. No use for anybody to pound on the table. Was TR a table pounder? Yes. He sure was. Taft said, can't we just get along? Okay. By the way, Taft's first love was the law. The law. Uh, his goal in life was to be on the Supreme Court. He should have never been president. He hated the presidency. Now, there's an old saying, be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. Well, Taft's an example of that. He really wanted to be on the court, and he took this detour. I think that's the way I would describe it, to be the president, of the, and he hated it when he was president of the United States. But you know what? He served one term. Got this down. Taft the one termer. And after he's gone from the presidency, what does he uh, get? Yeah. Supreme court. He gets get that down. He gets to be on the Supreme Court. I'm going to take some students pretty soon. Oh, there's, uh, where is it? Uh, he uh, will be on the Supreme Court, and there's his bust. In the, uh, he, he actually became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So at the end of his life, he was happy. But I want to tell you, he was absolutely miserable as President of the United States. So there's his bust inside the Supreme Court. <coughs> Pardon me. There's his bust. Um, 
and he became the only president, former president so far, to serve on the Supreme Court. Okay, well, when you get that down, everybody get up and take a stretch real quick. We got a lot to do. Okay, have a seat. Well, here's the things he did. He, uh, you've heard of it, write this down. You've heard of the, well, there's one thing. President, you know, baseball just opened. Maybe it's just opening today. Anyway, early April. Yeah, is it, when was it? Last week? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, last where, Thursday. Where, where, Biden went and threw out a ball. Presidents, ever since Taft, presidents throw out a ball on the opening day. He probably just went down the street to the Washington uh, Nationals and pitched it out. But there's Taft throwing out a baseball. You know, baseball by that time has become our national sport. You've heard of the Oval Office? That's the president's office. Get this down. Taft built that. Look at it. There's the White House. That's called the residence. That's where the president lives. Uh, and that's where his office was up until Taft. This was Teddy Roosevelt's tennis court out here, and Taft ripped all that up, and he built that. And this is the West Wing. There's a there was a television show on, or it may still be on. Is there still West Wing still on? Well, maybe that's ancient history. But anyway, this is where the president meets with his cabinet. But there's the president's office. It's an Oval Office, and that's where Teddy Roosevelt used to play tennis. Okay. But every morning, President Biden now gets up uh, here in the red. They live up on the third floor, second or third floor, and he walks over to the Oval Office, and that's where he will uh, meet with people. Uh, when they have a press conference, I think this is the press room right here where the press gathers, and the president has a press secretary who goes out and every day and answers, you know, this is what the president's schedule is today, and asks qu answers questions. Once in a while, the president will go to a press conference there, although the president usually holds his press conferences over here in the East Wing of the White House. Uh, there's the Oval Office. That's uh, that's President Trump's Oval Office, okay? That's President Trump's Oval Office. Uh, there's President Trump. That desk, by the way, is most of you know, the president can have any desk he wants. Uh, the basement is full of desks. The basement is full of desks. Come on in. The basement is full of desks. But that one is one that was given. You remember Queen Victoria? Uh, she gave that to the uh, United States, and it's made out of the timbers of a British battleship. The, the British battleship was the HMS Resolute, and so that's called the Resolute Desk, and most presidents uh, use that. There's President Obama uh, with his staff. It must be a weekend or something. Uh, they ought to have ties on when they're in the Oval Office, but they don't. I, uh, anyway, there's President Obama. Some situations come up, and probably that's on a weekend he's doing that in the Oval Office, okay? So uh, Taft, uh, Taft built the West Wing. He built the Oval Office. Uh, he's just an easygoing, jovial sort of fella. He's really the opposite of TR. But you know what? Get this down. This is probably going to finish us for today. But this, despite the fact that he's not a big show off and he's not loud, he actually set aside more forest land than DR did. He just didn't brag about it. He set aside more for uh, public land, excuse me, than TR did. He did. He set aside more forest than t in four years than TR did in eight. And you know, Teddy Roosevelt was called the big trust buster. Well, this guy, this guy broke up ninety trusts. Uh, as compared to Teddy Roosevelt's uh, 40, 44, okay? The problem for Taft, and this is where we'll take it up tomorrow after your quiz, and take your notebooks home. I'm going to try and give you as many opportunities to make a decent, well, I've got a couple of minutes, a decent grade, yes. 90, 90, TR's 44. What would TR, what would TR have done? He'd have been on top of the White House with a bullhorn screaming about it. Taft just, he just kind of the guy, I'm president. People have elected me, I'm going to do my job, and that's that. I'll let the record speak for itself, not TR, okay? The problem for Taft, though, is this. Get this down very quickly. The problem for William John Taft is this. TR <clears throat> had been president for seven and a half years. 
and he had fought. Get this down. He had fought the conservatives to the nail. And who won? Teddy Roosevelt was a conservative. Who won? Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt did. He had whipped those conservatives for seven and a half years. The big oil companies, the big lumber companies. And now those big companies look at TR, look at TAS and say, you know what? TAS ain't no TR. We can get around him. We never could get around TR. You see what I'm saying? We can go over there and we can get this down. We can roll back some of the things that TR did. TR put restrictions on what force we can cut. We think we can get around TAF. TR said to the coal companies, you're not going to touch the Alaskan wilderness. The coal companies said, eh, we can go there. We can get around TAF. We can get around TAF. And that's going to be the problem in the Taft administration. And it's going to lead to a blow up in his administration, as you're going to see, that will largely be the end of his administration and the end of his presidency. And when we come back tomorrow, when we come back tomorrow, and we will take it up there after your quiz. Take your notebook home tonight and look at it for 10 minutes.